from the Physically Fit Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. It is time for another achy, breaky episode of Chemical Free Horticultural Hijinks. You bet your garden. I'm Mike McGrath. Are you looking forward to getting back outside to your garden, but worried about how you'll feel after working those long, dormant muscles? On today's show, we'll describe exercises you can do now so you don't break your back later. Plus, how to build an island resort out of plastic bottles. And your fabulous phone call questions, comments, tips, tricks, suggestions, and adroitly active accusations. So stay right where you are, cats and kittens, because it's all coming up faster than you enhancing your endurance right after this. Support for You Bet Your Garden is provided by the Espoma Company, offering a complete selection of natural organic plant foods and potting soils. More information about Espoma and the Espoma Natural Gardening Community can be found at ESPOMA.com. Welcome to another thrilling episode of You Bet Your Garden from the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. I am your host, Mike McGrath. Coming up later in the show, we are going to get you ready to garden. Instead of jumping right in with the way to garden without pain once you're out there, we're going to present a series of exercises which will get those dormant muscles warmed up so that you can do a better job with less pain outdoors. And it's all coming up in the question of the week. Plus your fabulous phone calls, which we will get to in just a minute. I have to say, we received a very nice voicemail from William in Cincinnati about the never-ending story of the Japanese maple that ate a piece of wrought iron garden decoration. Will works maintenance for a living and tells us that a 36-inch bolt cutter will reduce that former garden ornament to easy-to-remove pieces. He adds that a 24-inch bolt cutter might do the job, but definitely a 36-incher. Thanks, Will. I love it when listeners help listeners, because they can't always defend on me. Oh, and a note from yours truly, do this work before the maple blooms. And now we move on. 888-492-9444. Andrew. Welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Hi, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to have you here, Andrew. How are you doing? I'm doing well. And where is Andrew doing well? I'm in Richmond, Virginia. Okay, very good. What's happening? What can we do you for? So last summer, uh, we've got this uh, garden that was kind of inherited from my father-in-law. And my wife uses the French term allée to describe what we have on the side of the yard. Okay. Uh, but it's a line of... A line of crepe myrtles and then a lot of other things like hellebores and boxwood and azaleas. And over last summer, around June, I started to notice this kind of sooty black growth on some of the leaves. And by July, it had kind of covered up a lot of the leaves and the trunks on the crepe myrtles, which had also acquired these kind of white pustule looking fungus growth, I thought. Uh I was even growing on some lawn chairs and just kind of taking over. I did some Googling, and what came back was that it was probably some sort of sooty mold that wasn't necessarily going to harm the plants, but might have just been a factor of having a humid summer without a whole lot of rain to wash away any of the honeydew or other residue. Yeah, we wish. I believe... (laughs) You are the latest victim of a very new invasive insect from Asia um, that is called crepe myrtle bark scale. So this is a brand new one, not to be confused with other kinds of scale or aphids or anything like that. Uh, This is brand new, and it can be quite a bugger. At last count, so to speak, it had just moved into Virginia. 
So it's 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 really racing across the country. And I can only presume that crepe myrtle growers in between you and I are going to have to deal with it. Now, are your crepe myrtles the tree form or the shrub form? Uh, they are tree form. They're about 20 feet high at the tops. Ooh, so you difficult to prune them. Um, not too difficult with a, you know, a pruning saw, at least from the bottom. Okay. Wear a hard hat. Yeah. <laughs> Learned that the hard way. Oh, yeah, that is the hard way. You're lucky. Um, so are you feeding, uh, the, the trees and plants in this area? Uh, I occasionally will spray the leaves with a, uh, fish and kelp emulsion that I use on the vegetables. Oh, good. Um, but not a whole lot else. But no miracle grow, no lawn fertilizer, nothing like that? No. Okay. Um, fertilization would make these pests much worse. Now, okay. uh, you prune crepe myrtles in the spring about two weeks after new growth appears and it sounds like you've been pruning them properly just removing the amount that they grew the previous year you know some people yeah just kind of grabbing any of the branches that are rubbing against each other or you know starting to hang in a weird way Mm -hmm. well actually the rule is these are these are fast growing plants and you should cut them back um, by the amount they grew the previous year then, okay. you, then yes, uh, removing some branches uh, to open up the tree would be uh, a good idea. Now, um, prevention is going to be your best friend. Uh, these things overwinter, and then I believe the females crawl out of like splits in the bark and stuff like that. And they lay these white egg cases. That's when you really need to be available. Uh, Using a pressure washer loaded with just water, blast them off of every plant you see. It won't harm the plant, but it will dislodge these egg cases. Um, And that is vitally important. This is like... I don't know. My figures are generally from deeper south. Uh, But I'm thinking April, May is when you start noticing these uh, white egg cases. And you did send us some photos, right? Yes. Right, because we'll be putting the... I can't see them right now, but we'll be putting those Mm -hmm. up on the screen uh, to also help people identify this. Um, Your symptoms match exactly of this new pest. So, um, you know, do your pruning, uh, but as soon as those white cases appear, get rid of them. If they're down low, just wipe them off and drop them into a bucket with alcohol or soap in the bottom. And then I would urge you to use that pressure washer to reach the areas that are up high. 20 feet is not... A problem. I don't know if you know Route 13 um, heading on the eastern shore of Virginia, uh, but some of those crepe mm-hmm. myrtles are like 40, 50, 60 feet tall. So you, okay. yours are very manageable. And anything you can do to relieve crowding is good. I like the food that you're using. If the prop and don't be afraid to really spray these trees. I mean, you mentioned rain. Rain is not going to mm-hmm. do anything. A soft shower um, from a hose is not going to do anything. But, you know, these things put out laser beams of water. So they yeah. will really disrupt uh, the entire life cycle of this insect. And if it works but it's not perfect, um, move up to horticultural oil. Um, okay. I did get, get, I don't, I don't know how much help it was right now, but about three weeks ago I did spray some horticultural oil all over everything. 
Well, it won't hurt. That's the nice thing. Yeah. And was it dormant oil or a summer spray? Um, I believe it was dormant oil. Uh, it was Monterey brand horticultural oil. Right. Well, um, that's fine to use in the winter, but you might want to get a lighter horticultural oil. Dormant oil is traditionally okay. made from petroleum products, which is which is not a problem. It's very effective, and um, some people really need that heavy hit in the winter. Um, but the light summer oils are vegetable oils, so they're much gentler okay. on the plants when they're actively growing. But it's not your fault. You didn't do anything. You didn't do anything <laughs> wrong. Yeah. Um, and the the kind of black mold that's growing on the nearby plants is that should i also just kind of squirt them with the pressure washer to try to clean them off it depends on you know how fragile those plants are uh okay you know if you if you want the lazy answer just prune those parts off in the spring and let the plant regrow new which would also tell you if it's still coming down or not right okay all right man all right. Thank you very much. All right. Good luck to you, sir. Thanks. You too. Bye bye. Say it. Now, I used to know a girl lived down there, and she'd go out in the evenings and pick her a mess of it, care at home and cook it for supper. And if she had any leftovers, she'd dry it out and smoke it. But she did all right. Now down in Louisiana, where the alligators grow so mean, I lift a girl down a swag to the world. Hey, the alligators look tame. Well, it's time for me to take a little break and inform all of you that our special audio-only segment in the news is coming up. This time out, we present a story from the Associated Press about a man who built a floating resort out of plastic bottles he fished from the sea. And maybe he pulled a couple off of the beach. That's coming up on You Bet Your Garden. From the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Support for You Bet Your Garden is provided by the Espoma Company, offering a complete selection of natural organic plant foods and potting soils. More information about Espoma and the Espoma Natural Gardening Community can be found at ESPOMA.com. Welcome back to another thrilling episode of You Bet Your Garden. From the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA, I am your host, Mike McGrath. Coming up a little bit later in the show, are you tired of being tired and sore after your first weeks out in the garden after a long winter's rest? Well, we will have a double-barreled series coming at you. First one is today. And that is exercises you can do now to get you prepared to get out there and work those long, dormant muscles. That's really important. We don't want you to miss it. And you won't if you stay tuned. Meantime, fabulous phone calls. 888-492-9444. 888-492-9444. Lola. Welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Thank you. Where are you? I'm in Memphis, Tennessee, sir. All right. Always a pleasure to talk to our 
friends down there. And it's Lola in Memphis. What can we do you for? Sir, I have some elephant ears. And when I moved into the house, they grew and they was beautiful. Mm-hmm. Now, over the years, they're started to get smaller. And I'm, I've been told there's too many bulbs down there. Mm-hmm. So I want to dig some of the bulbs up. but I don't know how to take care of them. Somebody well, told me to put them in a brown paper bag. Well, if you if you ask 100 people who don't know anything about gardening, you'll get 100 different answers no matter what. Yes, sir. I, I believe that. So um, the, they haven't shown anything above ground yet? No, they have not. Do you want to do it right away, or do you want to wait till after um, – they're done in the fall, which it would be easier. I, I want to get some of the bulbs up so I can plant them in other spots. That's what I want. Okay, so what you got to do, um, is your ground frozen? I know the weather's no. been crazy, and it's it's decent. You want yes. You want to get a tool called a poacher's spade which will work better than a shovel but if you have a a sharp shovel not a flat blade shovel you can use that so the reason i say it's easier in the fall is you can see where everything is right now you'd be you'd be working on memory and you're going to impact some of the bulbs but let's do it both ways so if you want to do it now you would dig around the area um, where you think the bulbs are. You want to be far away. You want to give yourself six inches away from where you think the bulbs are, and you want okay. that. And you want that shovel or spade to go deep in the ground. Yes. And then you use the foot pad um, to lift it up, and you'll either okay. you'll either get some bulbs. Or now you'll be much closer. So then you okay. do it again, always moving forward. Then um, then I'll change my mind. I would like you to, you, you know those bales of peat moss they sell at garden centers? Peat moss, yes. Uh, they make really small ones now, which are great. I would get a cardboard box. I would fill the bottom with some peat moss. And then I would arrange okay. the bulbs on top of the peat moss, um, put another layer on, mist it with a mister, a hand okay. mister, not a missus, uh-huh. and then clo- <laughs> close the box and store it in a cool place, not too warm, not freezing. Okay, okay. Now, if, okay. as you dig these up, I would urge you to replant the biggest bulbs where they are and store the smaller bulbs Um, because you're going to replant everything this this spring right yes 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 yeah everything i'm digging up i'm a replant yes yeah so put the biggest bulbs back where you found them Uh, it would not be a bad idea to feed them uh, a granulated organic plant food uh, made for bulbs now your bulbs are summer bulbs uh, okay, but okay. it's a good it's a, yes. It's a good time to feed them now, uh, because this is, you know, when they'll be growing actively. So just a little, or, right. Just a little organic plant food. Cover them back over, and store the others. And anytime you're bored, you have the time, uh, replant those in other spots. And if they're really tiny, I would go with the pots. I think they would look really okay. cool as miniature plants in pot. All right? Well, sir, I really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Oh, it's our pleasure. Thank you for calling. Bye-bye. Okay. Yeah, but bye-bye. 888-492-9444. Carol, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Hi, Mike. How are you doing? How are you? Oh, I'm just ducky. <laughs> you beat me to it. And Ducky has a new friend, a mushroom gnome, from an uh-huh. unknown admirer. It arrived today. 
Um, Great. I haven't made my mind up about it yet, but um, I don't know. The three musketeers there look pretty good together. If you're listening on the podcast, this is why you should watch the TV version, which you can find at our website, or I just discovered I'm on Passport, PBS Passport. So now I'm radio, TV, podcast, and streaming. Is there anything left to conquer? I don't know. Uh, how are you doing, Carol? <laughs> good, good. And where's... That was a crazy question. Oh, I'm from uh, Sudbury, Massachusetts. No, wait a minute. <laughs> we, we have been getting a lot of calls from Sudbury. Are they all from you? <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Oh, <laughs> you don't, do you know. so. I, <laughs> don't be a... Well, maybe a few, maybe yeah. a few. <laughs> well, I always think of you when I have a crazy question that I just don't know where else to find the answer. <laughs> well, uh, crazier you the question, know. the better the rating, <laughs> so proceed. Okay, well, it seems in Sudbury, where I am, um, there has been a bumper crop of deer. And so I, my house is up a hill, but I have an area at the bottom of the hill closer to the road that, um, you know, I can, it has good sun and I can garden down there in the summer, but I don't go down there very much in the winter. And um, anyway, I went down there recently and it was just deer poop everywhere. And I was really, you know, I had never encountered that before, so I didn't know whether or not it, I don't know anything about the quality of deer poop, <laughs> whether it's a terrible, you know, if it's full of nitrogen like other poop, and whether I should try to shovel it and get it out of there, or if I could cover it with compost or um, something else. If okay, you had any... so here's an easy way to remember. Um all herbivore poop is acceptable as manure in a compost pile. Um, okay. The feces from animals that don't have hooves, that have soft paws, that is totally unacceptable, and you must stay away from it because okay. they are exposed to parasites through that soft uh, paw, whereby you don't get that with uh, cloven hoof animals. So, oh. yes, uh, deer poop would be good. I can remember a couple of years ago, I was uh, straightening up uh, a lane in my garden, a pathway for the kids to get back to where two streams converge. And I saw all these little piles of round pellets and I went back and got a five-gallon bucket and filled them up with it. And I mixed it into my compost pile. And I was certain that it could only improve the contents. And let's face it, you're getting even. That poop, <laughs> that poop came from the plants of yours that the deer exactly. ate. It's the exactly. circle of life. It's like Disney. <laughs> Okay. Now oh, that's great news. It you, is because they oh they've devoured you know the rhododendron and holly. They were I mean, just, just they were just recycling it into natural okay. fertilizer for you. See, and you don't even okay. appreciate it. No, I didn't know. I'm thrilled to find out. I knew you'd know. <laughs> um, do you have a compost pile? Yes. Oh what, yeah. What's in it? Um, mostly, you know, shredded leaves and, um, coffee grounds. Mm -hmm. I try not to put, I have one of those Vitamix things that you recommended. So oh, the drying for, thing. Aren't they amazing? Yeah. I love it. I love it. Everybody. Because I have so many eggshells. Yeah. It's yeah. great for eggshells. For people who don't know what we're talking about, um, Vitamix, not that long ago, a year or two ago, came out with this device that you sit on your counter. Is it called the recycler? I and, think so. And you fill it with all your kitchen waste and turn it on, and then it makes weird gurgling sounds for like an hour. 
But what it does is chop it up, then it heats it. And when it's done and you open the lid, you have a, like the finest compost you've ever seen. It really, really works well. Anyway, yeah. Um, yeah, so just mix the deer poop in with your compost. <laughs> Don't okay. put it in the recycler. No, no. <laughs> Don't worry. Oh, I can't imagine the smell. Honey, what's okay. that smell? <laughs> Is there a dead mouse under the fridge again? <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's great to add to your compost pile. You know, make sure you oh. mix it in. Okay. Don't make a layer. Yeah. And right. uh, it will improve your compost. Okay. And That's and fantastic. for the deer, if you're worried about them getting into your garden, take yeah. take a look at a device called the wireless deer fence. I won't... I've tried it. What? You've tried it? <laughs> I have, yeah. No, I listen to you. Okay. Glad somebody <laughs> Any does. product you miss, <laughs> anything you mention, I usually try. But, um, no, it just, I well, I don't know that we, we have a lot of deer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think, um, you know. And then uh, the I, second, especially in the summer, is the motion-activated sprinkler. Right. Yeah, I love that works, but I, I don't have great pressure with my hose. You can so. actually buy simple devices at your hardware store that will increase the pressure in that line. Okay. Hello. It is time for our special feature in the news in which we bring you important stories about what's going on in the world of gardening and just environmental stuff in general. It's been pretty gloomy lately. So this week, I went looking for a good news story. And I found it in The Morning Call, my local paper, dated Saturday, March 11th. It is an Associated Press story and I, I would read the author's name, but I honestly can't pronounce it. I'm not even sure I can pronounce the place because all of this takes place in Uganda. And the name of the area is Luzera, L-U-Z-I-R-A. The article begins, flowering plants rise as if by magic from Lake Victoria onto a wooden boat, giving it a leafy ambiance that enchants many visitors. This initial attraction becomes more compelling when the tourists learn that the greenery emerges from an innovative recycling project that uses thousands of dirt-encrusted plastic bottles to anchor the boat or maybe float the boat. I don't know, but they're under the boat. Former tour guide James Katiba built the boat in 2017 in response to the tons of plastic waste he saw in the lake. He realized his vessel could serve as an example of a sustainable business on the shores of Lake Victoria, a floating restaurant and bar that could be unmoored and move to different locations. Now, Lake Victoria is the world's second largest freshwater lake and spawns three countries. It is plagued by pollution, runoff, and our old foe, our endless foe, endless numbers of discarded plastic water bottles. Layers of this plastic waste float near some beaches during the rainy season a real problem for the tourism industry and the fishing industry. So Katiba started by asking fishermen nearby to collect plastic bottles as they saw them. He received more than 10 tons of bottles within six months. Batches were tied up in fishing nets and daubed with solid dirt creating bases upon which the boat is moored, and also fertile ground for climbing, tropical plants. 
marketed as the floating island. The boat can serve 100 visitors at a time. This is morning glory, he says proudly, caressing a vibrant flowering vine climbing up the side of the boat. And the photo accompanying the article shows that there's a lot of greenery on this wonderful vessel. A visiting businessman from Greece said he had never seen a place like this, praising the boat's accommodative atmosphere as he dug into his fish and chips. This is a very good idea, he said. If he's collecting the bottles and using them, it's fantastic. You're not only cleaning the environment, but also providing something unique, very unique, for visitors. You're not only cleaning the environment, but also providing something very unique for visitors a place to dine, a place to drink, and a place that is using up more plastic bottles than you and I can imagine. Katina says he hopes others will draw from his inspiration. We can only hope so. What a great story. Well, it's time for me to take a little break and remind everyone who is over-anxious about planting their spring peas to be sure and pre-sprout those seeds to prevent them from rotting in cold soil. Roll the seeds onto moist paper towels. Place the towels into Ziploc bags, but don't zip them close. Leave those bags out at room temperature and plant the peas outdoors when you see sprouts. I'm your sprout, Mike McGrath, and you're listening to You Bet Your Garden from the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. This is 91.3 FM, WLVR Bethlehem, WLVR.org. Welcome back to another thrilling episode of You Bet Your Garden from the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. I am your host, Mike McGrath, and we are in the stretch, cats and kittens. In just a little bit, we'll get to one of our most important questions of the week. How to get yourself ready to get out there in the garden and not make it a painful experience. Please don't miss it. It's coming up soon. 1-888-492-9444. Vicki, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Hey, Mike, how you doing? I am just ducky, Vicki. Thank you for asking. All right, where are you? Middle Eastern North Carolina. Okay, and before we went on the air, you said you had a freeze last night? Yes, yes. It got down to 29. Oof. Man, you guys are not used to that. No, and Friday is supposed to be 75. Oh, okay. I can get there by Friday. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What can we do for you? Okay. I sent you a picture of my um, 40-year-old snake plant, and it's it's propped up in a corner of my living room, and it won't stand up straight like usual snake plants. And I'm looking to see. Now, I don't think I've repotted it probably in more than 10 years. Okay, good. I, I know I know how to water it. Um, anybody tells me they're watering it correctly, I realize that's the problem. I remember the picture of your droopy snake plant. And I hope we'll find it and put it up on the air on the TV version. So I have a couple of heirloom snake plants that I've had since I was in college. And when I got your email, when the show got your email, I went to take a look at mine. Um, And I had two droopy leaves on each of them, but a dozen straight up leaves, just like your supposed to have 
um, snake plant, like, uh, well, snake plant, also known as mother-in-law's tongue, is considered one of the most bulletproof plants. And I think the reason it's been bulletproof with me is I had a big display of plants in my uh, dining room, and they were at the back, and they never got watered. I mean, literally, they would go six months without water. And that's exactly what they want because they are succulents. They are plants that are designed to hold water. Um, they're also rainforest plants, which means that they don't need direct sun. Uh, dappled sun, dappled shade, a south-facing window with a curtain in between, that would be perfect for them. That's, that's where it is. South-facing window with a curtain in between. Okay. And the majority of your leaves, if I recall, are sticking up straight, right? Yes, they are. But if I move it from that corner, they fall down. Well, don't do that. <laughs> it's like the old doctor <laughs> joke. Not. Yeah, I do. <laughs> uh, do you put them outside in the summertime? No, because I have too many rabbits. Okay. I don't think rabbits would eat a snake plant, but I don't know everything. And, okay. And, you know, if they're in tall pots, how are the rabbits going to get at them? Build little rabbit ladders or something? Right. Jump on each well, other's back? You know. So um, how often are you watering? Maybe once every three weeks. Okay. Cut back to once every two months. Cut okay. off. Okay. Cut off the droopy leaves. Um, and by the way, anytime you have a discolored leaf or a droopy leaf, cut it off right. because it makes you look like you know what you're doing. People right. only see the plant. They didn't see it pre-surgery. So take off the droopy leaves. Keep it in that window that it likes. Cut way back on the watering and do not repot it. One of my best. Okay. Um, mother-in-law tongues is in a pot where the roots have broken out. They've actually shattered one side of the pot. And, oh, wow. and that tells me that these plants like to be root bound. So uh -huh. I, I think it's a simple question of recognizing that these plants were designed um, to hold large amounts of water um, because in the climates where they come from, there are long periods of drought. But it's okay. The plants store water. So whenever you're thinking of watering, think less, not more, and much less frequently. Okay? Okay. And, and one more question. Go ahead. My gardenia outside is kind of yellow. I can't. I can't. We can't do a second question. We're already over our time okay. here in the studio. Okay, okay. So good luck with right. your mother-in-laws, and you. um, we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye-bye. Yes, we're finally here at the end of the long and winding road with the question of the week which we're calling exercises to get you ready to garden without pain. Julianne in Glenside, PA writes, I'd love to hear all your tips, tricks, and advice for people who love to garden but contend with physical disabilities or limitations. I think you have given more tips about reducing physical stress when gardening than you might think you have. After all, the way you gardened when you were 25 years old isn't the way you garden today. Oh, 25. I had hair. I was skinny. But, oh, all right, I'll get back to it. Valuable advice you've already given that immediately comes to mind is to use a flame weeder, water-powered weeder, or other long weeding tool to avoid bending over to use, quote, no-dig practices to avoid having to weed excessively afterwards, and to gardening containers on tops of tables. You've also urged people not to hesitate to hire help 
or ask people for help when they need it, and to be realistic. Accept that you might have to do less some years. Even one large tabletop container filled with strawberries can be satisfying. Gardening is so important to mental health. I'm sure there are people of all ages with a variety of physical capabilities that would love to hear how to garden in the body they have right now. You have been gardening for decades, so we know you have the tips. Can I go back to 25? Is you know, I had a ring that I could rub, and you know, I turned into a fly when that happened. July 27. 1984. That was the date my wife and I saw Bruce Springsteen perform at Saratoga Springs early in his Born in the USA tour. Previously a skinny guy, Bruce was now muscular and had even more energy than he had previously, which was quite a lot. Halfway through the concert, I turned to my wife and said, there's a great story here. I'm going to find out who trained him. After a lot of detective work, I found the man, Phil Dunphy, a physical therapist and exercise physiologist who turned me down for an interview a dozen times before finally saying, all right, if you can do Bruce's workout, we can talk. Luckily, I had been working out for many years. And so I survived the two hours of torture that Phil put me through. My legs were sore for a week, but I got the interview. Phil and I became good friends. And when I became the editor-in-chief of Organic Gardening magazine, we collaborated on a series of Get Fit to Garden and How to Garden Smarter articles. This is part one. These exercises are designed to get you into shape before gardening season by strengthening the parts of the body you'll use frequently. To reduce after-exercise soreness, take a warm shower for 5 or 10 minutes before you do these exercises to loosen up tight muscles. Then stretch gently after you exercise, never before. All right, we're going to start with your legs. This is the 90-90 wall squat. Put your back flat against a wall and sit if you were in a chair but without the chair. Be sure your feet are directly below your knees. Fold your arms across your chest and hold that pose for 60 seconds. Relax and then do it again. Do this series of two repetitions three or four times in a row. You will feel the, quote, good burn in your thighs, calves, and hamstrings. We move on to your shoulders. Place your arms in front of yourself, palms down, and then move them straight out to both sides. Hold each position for 15 seconds to start, and then gradually work your way up to 60 seconds for each position. Repeat this three to five times with a one minute break in between each exercise. We move on to many gardeners, personal bugaboo, your back. Don't do this exercise if you already have back pain. Instead, see a physical therapist for personal advice. This exercise is designed to prevent back pain, okay? Lie on your stomach, hands at your sides. Lift your upper back and head. Hold for a count of five, then release. Repeat this three times to start, if you can. If you can't, go less. Work up to 10 seconds, then 15 seconds, then 20. By the time you're ready to start gardening, you want to be able to do five sets of 20 seconds each. Your butt, lie on your stomach, hands at your sides, and lift your legs, holding them slightly apart. 
Do this for five seconds to start and repeat five times. When this gets easy, increase to 10 seconds and then 20 with a goal of making 30. Your abdominal muscles. In PT terms today, I would call this strengthening your core, which is essential for any kind of personal fitness. Lie on your back with your knees bent, arms crossed over your chest, eyes looking up at the ceiling. Lift yourself upwards from the middle of your back so that your chest moves towards the ceiling and your lower back is just slightly off the floor. Pause for a second and then slowly lower yourself back down and then pause again. Do not bounce. The movement must be smooth. Then do it again. Start with no more than 10 repetitions. Before you know it, swears Phil, you'll do this with ease. Common sense cautions. Stop immediately if you feel real pain instead of exercise burn. If you have physical limitations, Print out this article and show it to your physician and or physical therapist for their opinions. Audio only listeners, this article will appear with illustrations on the TV version of our show, easily watchable at youbetyourgarden.org. And that's not all, folks. Join us in two weeks and learn proper pain-free postures when you're actually out working in the garden. Well, that sure was some helpful information about getting fit to garden now, wasn't it? Luckily for you, the question of the week appears in print at the Gardens Alive website, To read it over at your leisure or your leisure, just click the link for the question of the week at our website, which is still and will forever be youbetyourgarden.org. Gardens Alive supports the You Bet Your Garden question of the week, and you'll always find the latest question of the week at the Gardens Alive website. Special note, the TV version of this week's show will feature photos of all the exercises we just discussed. Just check out our website, the name of which I am tired of repeating. If you don't know what it is, ask your kids. If you're a kid, ask your parents. Or you can ask some bum on the street for all I care. Yikes! My producer is threatening to give me fits if I don't get out of this studio. What does that mean? Oh, right, we were fit to garden. We must be out of time. But you can call us anytime at 888-492-9444 or send us your email. You're tired, you're poor, you're wretched. Email refuse teeming towards our garden shore at ybyg at wlvt.org. Now, I would get down on my knees to beg this of you, but I'd need two guys from control to come in and get me back up. So, please include your location, even if you think we know who you are, or it doesn't matter. Location, location, location. Hmm, Where did I hear that before? You Bet Your Garden is a half-hour public television show available for viewing on PBS 39, PBS Passport, and our website. It is also an hour-long public radio show and podcast, and they're all delivered and produced to you weekly from the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. I need a vacation. Our radio show is distributed by PRX, the public radio exchange. You Bet Your Garden was created by Mike McGrath. Mike McGrath was created when he was bitten by a radioactive wombat. Please don't ask him about the costume. Ken Queter is our musical director. Our chief content officer is Yoni Greenbaum. Our angel of the airways is Christine Dempsey. Our sound engineer and set decorator is cheerful Charlie Sarah. Our social media director is Amanda Norfleet. 
check out her fine work and all the fabulous pictures folks like you have sent in at the You Bet Your Garden Facebook page. Teresa Radke is our peerless princess of profound production. Our audio editor is the always lovely Jonas Bowen. Judicious Jake Boyer does the video. Our directorial director of direction is the harassed and harried Javier Diaz. Also starring Jacob Morris, Zach the Tack, and our beloved band of card sharks, roustabouts, and fortune tellers. Our CEO, Tim Fallon. Huh. He appears to be playing solitaire on his office computer. Yo, Tim, red six on black seven. Come on, pick it up. I'm your host and executive producer, Mike McGrath, and I'll be planting my free sprouted seeds before I can see you again next week.